The Hyde had its theatrical debut in London's Institute of Contemporary Arts in June of 2009. How did a team of determined and creative filmmakers on a micro-budget, for many of which this was their first feature film in a leadership role, transform a two-character play into a critically acclaimed and award-winning motion picture? The original idea was to write a theatre play. Uh, I'd worked with Alex McQueen as an actor and I really wanted to write something for him because one of the lessons that you learn as a writer is that character equals plot in every single case. Uh, and he had enough about him that suggested that there was somewhere to go in terms of writing him or creating a character for him. Um, and but as a happy coincidence at the same time, a friend of mine who had been living in the Suffolk area, in fact on the Suffolk coast, had called to tell me that uh, she'd had a mass invasion of bird watchers in her garden who'd all come in search of this wonderful bird called the sociable plover. So I thought, as well as this wonderful vagrant bird that's blown off course and turns up in Suffolk, with all the twitches chasing it, um, there were parallels with this man in isolation, this character, Roy Tunt. Uh, ran for three weeks in a very small pub venue in uh, North London, near Islington. Uh, 50 people fit maximum into the theatre each night. I uh, worked with Tim Whitnell, and he invited me to the opening uh, night. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, it's a great play, uh, and I went back and saw it uh, two more times. Um, and I thought it would make a, a great film. He brought me the project and said uh, he'd like me to edit it because we'd basically done a few short films together. And uh, the uh, and I suggested that he use a guy that I work with all the time, which was Marek. And Marek read it um, overnight, insisted on meeting the next day. We met up. <laughs> Um, he pitched like crazy, he had um, notes. told us everything about the yeah. film. He'd read it more times than we'd ever read it, <laughs> probably more times than we will ever read it, and really kind of um, bowled us over. I was immediately um, drawn to the dialogue, to be honest with you. Um, and and I, what I really liked was this kind of inane banter that, that happened between these two characters. And you seem to have uh, this situation where they swap lead roles throughout the film and I very much wanted to explore the idea of there being two totally independent stories running at exactly the same time and only at the very last point of the film do the stories actually connect to each other. Righty ho, a man in low, let us have a butcher's. Alex McQueen was pretty much on board from the beginning. The, the play, The Sociable Plover. It is uh, him. It, it's him. Which is frightening. When you've seen the film, you'll know why that's frightening. But the, it yeah, is him. Yeah, it's he him. He is Roy Tunt. He is Roy Tunt, but he doesn't birdwatch Alex, does he? Or maybe he does. Maybe he does. We don't know. He never tells us about it. Well, Alex McQueen um, was in the stage play. And his performance in the stage play was absolutely fantastic. It was larger than life. His character, he's a particular and very private man. But you, after a certain amount of time, you, you definitely get the feeling that there is something more to this character than, than meets the eye. So what I was looking for for the character of Dave John was a, a man who, in some way, you can see that he has been to a dark place, that he has dealt with emotional torment. Um, I wanted to find a man who had a rough diamond quality. The part itself was, uh, is, has a real sort of place in my heart, actually. The, the character and what he's, what he's been through is very sort of close to my heart, actually. So I, a, a lot of it I had a lot of sort of personal sort of truths that I sort of connected with. The living dead. Brilliant when you're nine. The production team began the search for a director of photography with the skills to engage the audience visually, bound by the limitations of only two characters and one location. George Richmond is a formidable character, but he's really good, you know, and he knows, he knows exactly what he wants. And he went off and did a few tests, came back, showed, showed me a few colours, came up with ideas for framing and, and how the camera might move. 
And then when we got on set, we went with what he thought was the best suggestion. The team now had to find a location to shoot this darkly comic thriller. They finally decided to shoot the interiors at famous Pinewood Studios, as well as on location on the desolate coast of the Isle of Sheppey. With locations in place, the creative team now had to construct Roy Tunt's world in the hide itself. Nick Palmer, production designer, truly created a third character in the hide. The hide was built from reclaimed timber to create an air of authenticity and constructed in a way that allowed filming of both interiors and exteriors. It was assembled in Pinewood Studios and dismantled and reassembled on location. The walls were made removable to allow the camera team to achieve the best camera angles possible. With the cast and crew in place, it was crucial to prepare everyone on board for what would be an intense and tightly scheduled shoot. We shot the hide in an incredibly short period of time, nine days. Marek worked closely with the actors to prepare them for the challenge to come. I simply rehearsed with the actors. I made sure that they hit the right marks within the set. And then the DOP came in and just set the camera to those shots. So really, he's had the freedom to bring a whole dimension of his own to the film. And in looking at the rushes, he's done an absolutely wonderful job. I always had this idea in my mind that there would be different uh, points of light within the hide that would represent different moments in, in the narrative. So, for example, if they're confrontational, you'll find that they're often at the front of the hide with the light, where it's very flat on their faces. If they're feeling more... Um, like they can communicate with each other and get along with each other, then they sit in the middle of the hide because the light becomes softer. At the very back of the hide, I wanted that to be like confession. So any time you know, either of them was talking about something personal or, or, or telling some kind of truth, that they, that they would want to do it in the dark and they would step into this dark area. With principal photography completed, it was Colin Sumption's job to start making sense of the hours and hours of footage the team had created. The challenge is, uh, obviously, when you've got two people, um, is to try and keep it interesting for just over an hour and 20 minutes. That's really difficult to try and keep exciting or interesting. So that, that's what I thought was really exciting about the project, because it would challenge me to try and make it interesting for that long. The film now edited, Debbie Wiseman began to compose the music behind the movie. The score of the film was played by the Royal Philharmonic, and recorded at Angel Studios in London. The interesting thing as a composer when you read the script is that really you can go completely in the wrong direction just from a script because what you see on the page sometimes is entirely different when you actually see it on the screen. So I read the script and it was so vivid and so a brilliant dialogue, I could imagine it absolutely. I started sketching a few ideas. But it was only when I saw it on the screen that suddenly it comes to life and I started to get the idea for the theme of the hide, the theme of the two characters. I hope the audience has come away from this film um, feeling that they've travelled on a journey and that they've been taken to an unexpected place. It's, it's a really tight, neat, crisp film that kind of uh, engages on several levels as a sort of intellectual stimulation at the same time. You're sitting there going, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Um, I think they'll, they'll, they'll enjoy it. It's a roller coaster ride. I think it's, it's very. There's a, there's, a, there's a few shocks and turns and twists. It's a great combination um, uh, of terrific dialogue and a really sort of interesting plot. To be honest, that's its two major qualities. So it works. It really, you know, it gets you. It gets you. Back. The film premiered at the prestigious Dinar Film Festival in October 2008 where Empire Magazine named it their pick of the festival. Since then, the film has gone on to win Best Actor for Alex McQueen at Syracuse, Monaco and Marbella, Best Cinematography at Syracuse and Monaco, and Best Film at Swale Film Festival.
which this was their first feature film in a leadership role, transform a two-character play into a critically acclaimed and award-winning motion picture. The original idea was to write a theatre play. Uh, I'd worked with Alex McQueen as an actor and I really wanted to write something for him because one of the lessons that you learn as a writer is that character equals plot in every single case. Uh, and he had enough about him that suggested... Uh, night. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, it's a great play. Uh, and I went back and saw it uh, two more times. Um, and I thought it would make a, a great film. He brought me the project and said uh, he'd like me to edit it because we'd basically done a few short films together. And uh, the... Uh, and I said... Wonderful Vagrant Bird that's blown off course and turns up in Suffolk with all the twitches chasing it. Um, there were parallels with this man in isolation, this character, Roy Tunt. Uh, ran for three weeks in a very small pub venue in uh, North London, near Islington. Uh, 50 people fit maximum into the theatre each night. I uh, worked with Tim Whitnell and he invited me to the opening... The Hyde had its theatrical debut in London's Institute of Contemporary Arts in June of 2009. How did a team of determined and creative filmmakers on a micro-budget, for many of which... ...that there was somewhere to go in terms of writing him or creating a character for him. Um, and but as a happy coincidence at the same time, a friend of mine who had been living in the Suffolk area, in fact on the Suffolk coast, had called to tell me that... Uh, she'd had a mass invasion of bird watchers in her garden who'd all come in search of this wonderful bird called the sociable plover. So I thought, as well as this 